My name's Tony Gilland. I'm the Science and Society Director at the Institute of Ideas. I'm not going to say much by way of introduction, um, because I believe that everyone uh, knows exactly what the broad parameters of the debate are. I'm very torn on the issue personally, but you're not interested in what I think, because we've got a very, very uh, eminent panel. This morning, there was an article on the front page of The Guardian alleging the demise of NICE. Uh, it, it's not the case, and, in the, and we're about the only public body that's actually had an increase in our funding uh, since the coalition came in. So uh, don't worry too much about The Guardian. Uh, the National Health Service, uh, our unique healthcare system, is based on the principle of social solidarity. It tries to provide health care for us all from the cradle to the grave, or as some put it, from the womb to the tomb. It's funded by all of us through the taxes we pay. Parliament, as it should, decides on how our taxes should be distributed. It decides on how much should be devoted to health care provided by the NHS. So the NHS has finite resources at its disposal. These resources, though, are never enough to do all the things people want and need. Choices have to be made. Decisions about priorities have to be made, or if you like it, rationing. It's not a question of whether, but how. We have to decide between competing choices about which interventions represent the best value for money. Should we spend a lot of money on a few people and thereby deprive many others of cost-effective care? Or should we try to get the best return we can for the population as a whole for the money we spend? This is the crux of the matter. It is not about deciding how much life is worth. It's not about wanting to deny people uh, additional months or years of life. It's about trying to be fair to everyone, not just those with powerful lobby groups, with sophisticated public relations firms behind them, funded by wealthy pharmaceutical companies. It's also about trying to be fair to those without a voice, people who have no lobby group to shout on their behalf. We look at new interventions, often but not always new pharmaceuticals, and attempt to decide how their additional benefits relate to the additional cost, and to what extent this additional cost will deny others cost-effective care. We do so by estimating the additional cost using conventional accounting procedures and relate this to the additional benefits from usually the so-called quality-adjusted life year, the quali, which takes account of both the increase in the quality of life that a particular intervention uses, produces, set against the time for which it is enjoyed. We're all well aware that the quality doesn't necessarily capture every component of the improvement in quality of life, and our advisory bodies take it into a, this into account when coming to conclusions. NICE does not put a value on human life. All life is precious. But in prolonging the life of a few people by a month or two, we also have to consider the many other people whose lives could be prolonged for years or decades by cost-effective measures. Thank you very much. This debate actually is about equality. It is about the equal entitlement of all, of all citizens, regardless of all of the usual suspects, regardless of race, creed, colour, religion, but also regardless of disability, health state, or life expectancy or elapsed lifetime, the entitlement of all to the equal concern, <laughs> respect, and protection of our healthcare system. It's about, in other words, the debate is about how to ration, not whether to ration. I agree with Michael that uh, that's the crux of the idea. When NICE was not even a gleam in Michael Rawlins' mother's eye, I wrote the following, which was eventually published uh, in my book, The Value of Life, in 1980. And I'll repeat it now. All of us who wish to go on living have something that each of us values. Each of us values equally, although for each it is different in character. For some a much richer prize than for others. And we none of us know its true extent. This thing is, of course, the rest of our lives. So long as we do not know the date of our deaths, then for each of us, the rest of our lives is of indefinite duration. Whether we are 17 or 70, in perfect health or suffering from a terminal disease, we each have the rest of our lives to live. So long as we each want to live out those lives, however long that turns out to be, then if we do not deserve to die, we each suffer the same injustice, the same terrible fate if our wishes are deliberately frustrated and we are cut off prematurely." End of quote. 
So I have for a long time taken an egalitarian view of life opportunities. Nice defenders, in this case, uh, not Michael Rawlins, but uh, Claxton and Collier, have said, quote, the prevailing view seems to us, however, to have been that people not only prefer good quality of life to poor quality of life, but also more life of a given quality to less. Of course that's true. Of course that's true. We each want that for ourselves. I want more life of better quality. But it doesn't follow from the fact that I want more life of better quality for me, that I am somehow committed to the view that where different people are to get the life opportunities, I'm committed to the view that those with more life of better quality should gain preference in treatment or should be funded by NICE. I maintain that contra the quality assumptions, the value of life and hence the moral importance of saving a life is not proportional to the length of the life or the length of unelapsed lifetime in prospect or indeed to quality of life. It follows that life years to be gained from treatment are irrelevant when different persons are to receive the treatment. This is the point so well made by Judge Mars Jones in a judgment which I think captures the idea. And he said, however gravely ill a man may be, however gravely ill a man may be, he is entitled in our law to every hour that God has granted him. That hour or hours may be the most precious and important hours of a man's life. There may be business to transact, gifts to be given, forgiveness to be made. Mars Jones' point is precisely the one I am making and the one I have consistently made against Nice. And, for that matter, one shared by both English law and even by common sense. The size of a disaster, including disasters meted out by Nice, is measured by the lives lost, not by the life years lost. English citizens are, contra Nice, entitled to have their lives valued by the NHS, not simply their quality-adjusted life years. The bottom line is this, and as I think Michael Williams himself has said, but uh, certainly others, no, I think this actually was uh, Tony Claxton, the health benefits that it is estimated could be gained from any technology are less if they are less than those estimated to be foregone by other patients as other procedures are necessarily curtailed and not undertaken, it is this comparison of health gained and health foregone that is at the heart of the rationale of cost-effectiveness analysis, which Michael just repeated. But NICE can't make those calculations, and doesn't. On their own admission, does not make those calculations. So the, the moral force at the heart of the NICE methodology is that not licensing a particular drug, or not approving it, is justified because the money can be more importantly deployed elsewhere. But since NICE does not know where the money saved in any given case will be deployed, it can't make that calculation. It might be deployed less effectively on things that we would approve less. So the whole rationale, the whole justification for what NICE does is lacking. Just to give you some, I'm not saying these aren't important uses of money, but I, the last figures I have, NHS budget for laxatives, 57 million. Analgesics, 449 million. Paracetamol, 43 million. Nicotine dependence treatments, 40 million. Viagra, 33 million. Drugs for the treatment of obesity, 47 million. Foods for special diets, 57 million. Gluten-free bread, 10 million. Now, I'm not saying these things should not be provided by the <coughs> NHS. I'm saying that in many given cases, they are not plausibly more important than life-extending drugs. And it's only on the assumption that they would be judged by us all to be more important that NICE can justify its decisions. Hence, its position is untenable. Thank you. I want to argue straight away, and it's what really Mike said, that NICE is not in the business of putting a price on life and its sentimental rhetoric to suggest that that's what its business is. It's about getting the maximum benefits, such as lives saves, all lives are equal, from the resources that are made available to NHS. And to the extent that it is successful in this respect, it is an important part of admittedly imperfect solution to a problem. And I think all parties need, uh, agreed we need rationing. I mean, I don't think there's a disagreement there between John and Mike. Now, where resources are squandered, lives are lost. So life is not about putting a price on a particular life, on your life as opposed to my life or whatever, or the one that it's a, the one lives are visible, it's about valuing all lives equally. It's exactly what John would wish, and that's the ethical position I think we're entirely in agree with. 
And if you do value all lives equally, then you need to find some way of ensuring that resources are spent equitably and effectively. What value is put on each life, in terms of money to be spent on treating patients with a particular disease, is not determined by NICE, but by the larger negotiations within larger society between many groups, and ultimately between the politicians and the electorate. So whatever the outcome of those negotiations between, say, the politicians and the electorate, there will still need to be rationing. And the question then is whether rationing should be carried out randomly, whether it should be dictated by the accident of historical precedent, whether it should be guided by the decibel system, as Mike indicated, where they're orchestrated by patients and their supporters and lobbyists, whether the Daily Mail should be calling the shots, or whether it should be carried out in such a way as to maximise the health gains delivered to the NHS from which we would all benefit equally and be treated equally. And that's where NICE comes in. Now, it's interesting, NICE frequently attracts headlines, uh, but they're usually about whether a particular treatment is, or more often, is not to be funded within the NHS. But the invisible backstory, which attracts no headlines at all, is the impact that this decision will have on the availability of other treatments for other patients with other problems. If I succeed in persuading NICE to fund a drug that costs half a million pounds and will add 20 minutes to a patient's life, I will also have succeeded in diverting resources from other patients who may have benefited more from that expenditure. And it seems to me that we don't know exactly where the money is being wasted, but what we do know is it is not being used to maximum benefit. Now, while it is deeply human to be concerned with the patient who's in front of you, and as a doctor for 35 years, that patient in front of me was my primary concern, this humanity hides a relative indifference to all the other patients. It ignores the fact that waste, wastage in one area is death in another. Every disease and every patient is in competition with every other disease and every other patient for resources. So it's simplistic to talk about rational rationing as placing a price on life. It's about valuing all <coughs> lives equally. Now for the second question, is NICE the solution or part of the problem? Now in this respect, from my own experience as an NHS in an unglamorous, not particularly clamant specialty for 25 years, and as someone who served unpaid on one of the NICE appraisal committees for three years, I, came, I formed the impression that NICE is the nearest we're going to get to a rational approach to using limited resources this side of paradise. Seeing the endeavours to arrive at an accurate estimate of costs, of benefits as determined by a huge variety of subtle measures, and of the <coughs> overall impact on the NHS was eye-opening to me. And by the way, John, NICE is not in the slightest bit ageist. And I can tell you, if it had been ageist, they would have had a tough time from me. Now, I'm not denying that there are several incompletely resolved problems in determining the best use of resources. And I want to put some of them on the table for a discussion. Firstly, is the choice of method to measure and compare the cost benefits of treatment. I happen to think that cost per quality is one of the best instruments we have. And it's up to those who deny this to devise better instruments. But let's at least talk about it. The second is the problem which Mike and I have often debated of orphan diseases. Diseases so rare that the cost of drugs for treating them are going to be very high. And then there are ways of dealing with this. The third is the claim that NICE, by delaying the rolling out of new drugs, is holding up innovation in big pharma. And we've heard that often enough. I personally think this is entirely false. And any negative uh, effect that NICE may have is minuscule compared with that of personal injury litigation industry. But there may be an argument to be had there. Fourthly, the cutoff at which drugs will and will not be available for the NHS, let's say £30,000 for a quality, seems, so, seems arbitrary. But it's not as arbitrary as having no cutoff <coughs> or one that responds simply to special interest lobbying. Now, the final concern hinted at in the blurb for this debate is that NICE guidelines limit clinicians' freedom, clinicians' clinical freedom. Well, I come from a time when clinical freedom included the freedom to act in one's ignorance, dishing out useless, dangerous and expensive treatments and resisting evidence-based challenges from colleagues and cowed juniors. That's the kind of clinical freedom we are well rid of and there remains plenty of room for the exercise of clinical freedom in doing one's evidence-based best in using your judgment about the management strategy that is most likely to benefit the patient in front of you and least likely to harm other patients by diverting resources from them. So I would suggest, in answer to the second question, that NICE is not part of the problem nor, of course, is it a complete solution, but it is a major contribution to ensuring that we maximise the health gains we get from the resources that are made, made available via the will of the people to the NHS and thus optimise their just and equitable distribution. Thank you. This side of paradise 
earlier this week in North London, I had a conversation with a hedge fund manager, and I said, well, what price life? And he said to me, hmm, about £28,000, which is, funnily enough, the sort of value that NICE would put upon a quali. Now, as an oncologist in practice, we um, look at the judgments that NICE makes and the instrument that NICE uses to make its judgment, which is the quali. And to paraphrase a, a very complex um, uh, tool, a quali is a judgment made by a person who may or may not have cancer on five, which is the European quality of life, five questionnaire uh, quality, on five life aspects, which could be depression, um, uh, mobility, pain. And that person makes a judgment and scales from naught to five or naught to 100 the improvement that an intervention, a new treatment, could make to their life. The health economists at NICE then take this questionnaire answer and use calculations that take about two pages and come up with a sum the cost of the intervention. And you will see, as an intelligent audience, you're all intelligent, um, that this is a subjective rating scale that doesn't actually bear any relevance, in my mind, to the true cost of a drug. I've got a list here. This is my list of drugs that, uh, in oncology practice, NICE has recently reviewed. Serafinib, rejected. Trobexidin, rejected. Lapatinib, rejected. Alotinib, rejected. Ofatumab, rejected. Trastuzumab, rejected. Mifatertamide, rejected. Imatinib, rejected. Everolimus, great jug, rejected. Bevacizumab, rejected. Azacitidine, rejected. Accepted, Pemetrexed, Jeftinid, Bortezomib, and Capecitabine. So my problem is that the instrument is not an accurate way of looking at how a drug works in practice. And according to the Richards Report, which came out in July of this year, we're 12th out of the 14 in the European League of Spend for the use of cancer drugs. So I think that NICE impacts very, very dramatically upon quality of life issues in our country. Well, this is about finding solutions, and this is about debating and trying to get to a better way of assessing things. And um, I, I would argue very strongly that actually what we need to do is reflect upon practice and what really happens with regard to drug costs. So if I'm an oncologist, I have a patient, God forbid, one of you in front of me, and I want to use a drug to treat him. In practice, I would treat that patient for two months with a drug and reassess them. The reassessment takes the form of CT imaging, so we do special x-rays, and see whether or not their tumour's got better. If it's got better, which will happen in maybe 30% of patients, then whoopee, we carry on with the treatment. If not, we stop the treatment. So in fact, what NICE has looked at is the cost of a drug for a year of treatment, and that year of treatment is, it doesn't actually pertain to the whole cost equation. Only a third of the patients will actually be proceeding for more than two or three months on treatment. So I would argue strongly that in a situation where we have to be conscious of cost, where, as uh, Ray has said so eloquently, if one person is treated, another person may not, at least have an accurate tool for assessing the cost, the real value of a drug. So when we come to what price, the price of life, which is the subject of our, our debate, when we come to rationing a medicine, we go back to that hedge fund manager who said £28,000, we take his valuation, and maybe that's what we should be spending upon drugs, not some notional ratioing up of costs Based, based on a subjective rating scale from a, 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 from a person who is giving a value to life quality improvements as a result of some therapeutic intervention. If somebody has a, a cure for cancer and I demonstrate that it isn't a cure for cancer, it's, it's no good sitting around to me and say, well, right, what's your cure for cancer? It's progress if we can show that what purports to be a solution is not a solution. It doesn't follow that anybody then has to have a solution of their own. One of your objections to the current method is that you don't think NICE gives sufficient weight to terminally ill patients. Is that what you're saying? It gives too much weight to the degree of life expectancy. And that is, I believe, intrinsically um, ageist because old people have less, by definition, have less life expectancy, other things being equal. Qualis are intrinsically ageist. You, NICE, choose to use them and you choose to use an intrinsically ageist uh, methodology. Now, I'm not suggesting that you, uh, you are against old people <laughs> at all. You nice or you personally.
John Harris there says qualities are ageist, but cannot produce a single example of where nice has been ageist with or without the use of a quality. It has never happened. So it's no good sitting there like the Buddhist moral philosopher, on the one hand this and the other hand that, uh, and never actually helping the real world. He has not got any suggestions to make about how we should use our scarce resources. And he says that, of course, we don't know what happens. Actually, John, we do know what happens. Is it the case, from what you said in your introduction, in the mechanisms that you use in terms of the quality and how it's uh, implemented, um, that less weight is given to pe people with a lower life expectancy no, actually, and that then you adjust for that potentially no, afterwards no, in no, some the, the, sort of the, committee the, the, no, 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 or, no, no, or no. not. No, the, 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 I mean, the problem is neither John nor... Jonathan actually understand the, 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 the way it's done. Right, and so it, explain briefly then it, how What it, happens how it is you, you, you determine to what extent a particular product extends, improves your quality of life, and if it improves your quality of life by 25% or whatever you like, and then you multiply that by the number of years in which you enjoy it. Now, the, the fallacy of John Harris is that he thinks that all treatments are a one-off occasion, that you either have, you know, have something life-saving in your lung, life-saving. Actually, of course, the cost goes on and on and on, because most of these things are pharmaceuticals. And so you, it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, you keep on taking the damn thing. See, the issue is that these drugs aren't given for the lifetime of the patient in many cases, but rather for a couple of months to 60%, and maybe a couple of, uh, maybe eight months for the remainder of the patient. So I'm arguing, Mike, not against NICE particularly in the judge, but rather the judgment tool that it uses. And I think if you could focus on that. NICE deliberations take into account how drugs are actually used, including having a go with a load of patients in whom it doesn't work and then withdrawing. That's part of the normal NICE appraisal. Hang on. And the second thing in regarding ageism, the, the reason why qualities as used within NICE are not ageist is because your life expectancy from being, say, 60 as opposed to 20 isn't relevant when it comes to evaluating a drug that's, for example, used at the very end stage of a cancer. So it's it, the very expensive technologies that NICE gets into a lot of, gets a lot of flack for, they are not ones where the patient's life is limited by ageing when it's not limited by the disease. I hope that makes that clear, and that's why it's not ageist. Take a drug like temsorolimus, which is a great drug for renal cancer, kidney cancer, which was banned. The nice calculation was that it cost £240,000 for quality to use. The real cost is £3,000 a month. And, uh, there's a discordance, there's a disparity, which I think needs to be focused upon. Okay. So, great, Ray, but you're wrong, I think. I was very interested in this point about the delay in holding up uh, drug treatments. And it is argued that this, this is being done better elsewhere, for example, in Europe, that they have quicker access to more drugs. Jonathan read out a long list of drugs that have not been approved and a short list of drugs, even in his field, uh, that would be relevant to him as a clinician, that have been approved. And plenty of people say in, in the press and elsewhere, it's done better elsewhere uh, uh, and that drugs are given quicker in Europe. Uh, Mike Richard's report on, on the uptake of drugs uh, made two points about anti-cancer drugs. He looks at all sorts of things. Uh, when it came to hormonal therapies for cancer, he pointed out that actually Britain was using them more than anybody else. Uh, when it came to the, some of the more expensive recent cytotoxic drugs, we do use less of them. In actual fact, it's nothing to do with NICE, because the ones that NICE said yes to were still very poorly used. And it's because oncological practice is rather different in this country as it is to many parts of Europe. And all my oncology friends, I haven't asked Jonathan about this, agree with, agree with it for all sorts of reasons. Oncologists don't like giving very nasty, toxic drugs to people towards the end of their life, unless they're in you know, pretty good shape. And that's, you know, that's a, 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 a practice thing. And this is what Mike Richards himself says, uh, and he's an oncologist, uh, that there is a very <coughs> considerable difference in the, in the practice. There are all sorts of other complications, like, you see, people say, oh, well, they have it all in France. Well, actually, the French have a different way of working out the prices of drugs. They negotiate with companies. Uh, on a similar basis uh, that, 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 that NICE does. But we don't have the opportunity to negotiate prices with companies. The French do, and it's all carried out in secret. But the other thing I would say, you know, if the qualities are so awful, according to Professor Waxman, why is it that they're used <coughs> widely uh, uh, in other countries? I know he doesn't realise this, and I'll because uh, he wrote in his article that it wasn't used anywhere else, but it is actually. Uh, the Swedes <coughs> use it, the Danes use it, uh, the Canadians <coughs> use it, the Australians use it. 
and, and the New Zealanders use it. Many other countries use it uh, as it's not just uniquely British. I think ageism is a, is a red herring. My quarrel with qualities... Just you, you raised it. <laughs> My quarrel with qualities is that it values the wrong thing. It doesn't value people's lives. It values life years. And all of its calculations are expressed in terms of quality adjusted life years. I think that what we should value are people whether or not they have a lot of life to be gained from treatment or less life to be gained from treatment, that that is, the, as it were, the unit that matters. Now, why we're all so emotional about it is for a very good reason. At the heart of this debate is precisely the question of what matters. At what is our moral concern directed? Isn't the problem here that the drugs don't work very well? Isn't that the problem? And that shouldn't we be investing all these hundreds of thousands into new research for treatments that would give us more than six weeks or two months? Isn't that the problem? So I would strongly argue that you can calculate the cost of drugs given to that uh, person easily, clearly, without the complication of the quality. And the way that you do that is, for example, if he's uh, got kidney cancer and you'd like to prescribe a drug which is really good called Temsorolimus, which we're not allowed to, to prescribe, the cost per quality for that drug is £204,000. The real cost is £3,000 per month. So if you are going to prescribe the drug for 12 months or 14 months, that's your, for your, your multiple. So I would argue, not against NICE, because I think it's great we have, a, we have to have a system to look at, uh, uh, at drugs and whether they're worthwhile, but the instrument that they use, which does not reflect practice, nor is it practical, nor does it relate to real situations and real people. There was a question that was not answered directly by Mike, which I'd like to talk about, which is to do with how drugs are um, allowed in other countries, the time to time frame for allowance, and how drugs are um, passed through to um, approvals in this country. So my specialization is prostate cancer. Earlier this year, there was a new drug trialed in prostate cancer, which was called cabazitaxel. We have great names. Um, this was a fantastic drug, which uh, gave people three or four more months of, of life. And it went up to the FDA a month after the publications. The FDA approved it. I've got some more bits of paper here, great on paper. And I can, I've got some timescales for approval of our drugs in the UK. So after the EMA is approved, NICE comes in. This is for 2009. This is the time course for NICE approvals. 17 months, 9 months, 13 months, 19 months, 9 months, 13 months, 10 months, 14 months, 12 months. So that's the reality. And I think it's a reality that comes from a, a great complication of bureaucracy. We need to make judgments. We are rational people. We have finite resources. But please use the correct instrument. Herceptin, trazuzumab, uh, for early breast cancer cost £24,000, uh, but it's cost-effective because it does just what John wants. It, it, it cures people, a proportion of people, with breast cancer. Uh, and so it's highly cost-effective for that reason. It also actually produces a lot of cost savings. Our problem in the past is that we've had to wait until ministers refer topics to us before we can review them. Yeah. Now, in the last year... Well, that's quite important. It is. In, in, in the last year, actually, we don't have to wait for ministerial referrals for anti-cancer drugs. My quarrel with, with NICE on this, in this regard is that the moral force of their argument about cost-effectiveness is that the money will be used better elsewhere. But since they don't survey the whole health budget and they don't reallocate in accordance with some conception of priority that we would agree on, they can't do that. So they can't actually do cost benefit analysis. All they can do is say that this is expensive, and were this money used for something really better, it would be better used. But since they don't know that it's going to be used for something really better, and they can't know that, they're not doing cost benefit analysis, whatever they say. If they must ration, which I accept that they must, I accept that rationing is necessary, they must choose in a way that does not prefer. Two things in favour of NICE. Number one, as a specialist in the care of older people, NICE has consistently produced guidelines to highlight good care for common conditions of ageing, like falls, like incontinence, like dementia, that were neglected before. Secondly, on a couple of occasions, like fracture me medicine or uh, influenza vaccination, they've ruled in favour of older people over younger people, so the accusation of ageism I refute. 
And the second thing is at least nice enables public reasonableness. It can be challenged through the courts, just like the dementia ruling was challenged in the courts, and they have to show their workings. And that has to be better than backdoor covert rationing. Turning to the other side, I completely understand uh, Professor Waxman's argument about uh, cost-based valuation for cancer drugs. What I haven't quite understood, though, hip fractures kill as many people as, as cancer, for instance. How do you compare the £16 a year it costs to give people treatment for osteoporosis versus £3,000 a month for a cancer drug without having some system of transparent allocation? First of all, just such a privilege to be here and to hear debate and just think about our society and what it allows, what it facilitates, and compare it with others. So I thank the Institute for Ideas for allowing us to express our ideas. And the focus that I would summarise is that if we, we need to look at the real cost rather than notional costs of interventions. And I think this produces a more simple and easier way of defining, and indeed more rapid way of defining whether or not something it can be used in our society. One of the things I found extremely interesting was that people talked about the quality of death, and it was a very important statement about quality of death. And that's a good example how even within cancer care, there's competition, that resources spent massively on drugs divert, or very expensive drugs with marginal benefits, diverge from humane care for people who, 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 are, who are dying. Uh, I don't dissent actually from what um, Ray has just said, except that we need a system, whatever it is, in, in which everybody's chance of having their health gain, which will necessarily be different, and some of it will be small, given equal weight with everybody else's. When we said yes to Herceptin, three primary care trusts had to abandon their at-home palliative care service in order to fund it. There is a price one has to pay for making these decisions, and it's very uncomfortable. And it's no good talking about tossing a coin, you know, God almighty, uh, it's never going to work like that. When NICE was set up, uh, Frank Dobson was the Secretary of State, and he was asked privately by a good friend of mine whether he thought NICE would work. And he said, probably not, but it's worth a bloody good try, and we've given it a good try. Okay. Thank you.